The 1989 Batman was such a major hit all around the world, grossing, costing about $45 million to actually make for its budget, but grossing a hell of a lot more than that. Somewhere close to, I guess a ballpark figure would probably be about uh, 91 million, it were 91 million worldwide, which at the time was, well, a pretty good box office draw. Now, the question was, did Warner Brothers want to do a sequel? The answer was obvious. Yes, they did want to do a sequel. After all, when you have a movie that grosses that much at the box office, a sequel is inevitable. But the real question was, was Tim Burton interested in doing a sequel? He kind of felt that after the first film, he'd sort of shot his wad on that, and he didn't really want to have anything to do with Batman again. The truth was, Burton was kind of burned out. He was only 28 years old, and he just directed his first big blockbuster with Batman. So, after that, he decided that he would do his own project with Edward Scissorhands, which was a nice break for him to sort of break away from the whole Batman thing for a while. But at the same time, while making Edward Scissorhands, Burton was still intrigued by the other characters in the Batman mythos, including Penguin, Catwoman, and even Two-Face. But <clears throat> the thing was... Warner Brothers wanted the Penguin to be the next villain in Batman. Burton himself was more intrigued by Catwoman. So they agreed to a deal where they'd shoehorn both of them in. I'm sorry, shoehorn is an ugly word. And with the three of them walking around in their costumes, as Keaton put it himself, felt like Elvis walking into Caesar's palace. What was different about shooting the second film from the first was at the time of shooting the first film, there was no talk of the word franchise. It simply didn't exist. So no one quite knew what to expect, whether that film would be a success or a failure. If it was a success, yeah, absolutely. There were going to be toys for it, and games, and also all sorts of paraphernalia that you could think of. And don't forget, Jack Nicholson got a very sweet back-end deal from merchandising. But this time around, it was a little bit of a different situation. T-shirt makers and also toy companies were, scramble, were scrambling to ask, well, what's the character going to look like? And Burton would say, we haven't designed the character yet. And the actors were perfectly willing to have their likenesses used for the action figures, which was a great boon for sales. But that's something we'll have to get into in the afterward. For instance, Note this action figure of the Penguin from Batman Returns. It looks nothing like the Danny DeVito Penguin. Actually, it's sort of as a repaint. Burton had finally shown some sketches to Warner Brothers, and they loved them right away. For the role of the Penguin, it seemed like there was no other choice but Danny DeVito from Taxi fame. And even from movies like Other People's Money, Ruthless People and throw Mama from the train. And if you go even further back, you might not have realized that he was also in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. What attracted DeVito most to wanting to play the Penguin was a sketch that Burton had drawn that read, My name is Jimmy, the hideous Penguin Boy. So, having worked together before, both Michael and Danny had just the right chemistry. So, everything worked out for the best. Michael and Danny had worked together before on Johnny Dangerously. If you've never seen that movie, I highly recommend it. Even after the embarrassing porno theater debacle, Tim Burton was still nice enough to throw Rubens a lifeline and actually cast him as the Penguin's father. Interestingly enough, Paul Rubens would go on to play the Penguin's father in the Gotham series. Even Madonna was considered. Wait, <clears throat> there we go. Go ahead. Initially, Annette Benning was cast to play Catwoman, but she was pregnant at the time and couldn't do the film. Burton was sadistic and was happy for her, but also disappointed because now he had no actress for Catwoman. Sean Young was also considered to play Catwoman. As a matter of fact, she had been considered originally to play Vicki Vale in the first Batman film. <laughs> and what she did to try to get in the sequel? 
She even showed up on the Joan Rivers show in full cat costume on March 16th of 1991 when the plans were underway to do the Batman sequel. And she even she, she even went to Warner Brothers Studios to try to get in in full cat costume, or rather makeshift costume. It frightened the hell out of Tim Burton so much that he just didn't want to work with her anymore. And this actually did happen. Chris Kenny, Michael Keaton, and even and even a couple of other people at Warner Brothers actually escorted her off the lot personally. But not to worry, Jim Carrey did give her a break a couple years later in, in Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. Since they had dated before, Michael Keaton had suggested Michelle Pfeiffer for the role of Catwoman. She'd already been in other films like Grease 2, and uh, <laughs> the less I say about that, the better. I don't think anybody had a problem with Catwoman and the way she was portrayed, other than to say that her character wasn't fully developed or meaningful in some way. I don't really believe that anybody had any problems with her. Well, maybe a few Christian conservatives, but well, then again, you know how they are. In the end, Michelle Pfeiffer was chosen because at the time she was actually dating Michael Keaton, I think, or had dated Keaton. And also the fact that, well, Keaton kind of recommended her anyway, <laughs> after the incident with Sean Young. Michael Keaton had commented that, while making Batman Returns, that he could only offer sympathy to both Michelle and Danny because they were constantly getting lost on set as they'd be moving sets, props, and buildings around. And of course, poor Michelle could never find her way to the studio. Keaton had wanted to talk to her about that. Marlon Wayans, <clears throat> excuse me. Marlon Wayans was also tapped to play Robin in Batman Returns. There were, there were already Robin action figures laid out for the Batman Returns film. But, of course, once again, even though the contract was signed, nothing really came of it. And, as Tim Burton said, they had decided they had too many characters. So, no Robin in this one. Surprisingly, though, Tim Burton and his crew actually got very few directives from Warner Brothers. No one was saying, you must have Robin. They did try it. They tried something that involved Robin. But, again, as Tim said, at the end of the day, they decided they already had too many characters. And, well, even without Robin, they'd still have too many characters. But that's not all. So, supposedly, the idea was that if we don't do it in this one, well, maybe in the next one. And, surprisingly, the toy company... And surprisingly, Kenner actually did make a Robin action figure for Batman Returns. However, Robin was not used in the film, so I don't think the toy sold very well. Hey, if you're not in the movie, don't, don't plan on your action figure selling. You see, in Batman Returns, or Batman 2 as the working script was called, Billy Dee Williams was supposed to reprise his role as Harvey Dent and ultimately become Two-Face. And as a matter of fact, Billy D. Williams did sign on, uh, and they were ready to go, but then at the last minute, Warner Brothers decided they didn't need him. But don't despair entirely, comic book fans. There actually is a series of comics now that offer suggestions as to what the third and fourth Batman movies could have been like had they been done under Tim Burton's direction. Yep, Batman 89. I strongly recommend you check those out. But back to the actual backstory. Christopher Walken would be cast as an, as an original character, some corporate magnate named Max Schreck. Yeah, more about that later. Um, <clears throat> but you see, they decided that they were not going to bring back Harvey Dent to finally become Two-Face, even though Billy D. Williams had signed the contract to appear in the movie. They, for whatever reason, didn't use him. So we got stuck with Christian... <clears throat> so we got stuck with Christopher Walken in a powdered wig here. The idea behind it, of course, was very much the same thing with the first film, was that Batman was not going to be the one to steal the show by, as Tim Burton put it, dancing around the Batcave or making big speeches, that he wanted to be as unrevealing about himself as possible, and as very much in the shadows as much as possible. 
It was easier in the first film for Keaton because he was only going down there with Jack as uh, the Joker, but he figured this time, if he was gonna go down and blow it, at least he would go down and blow it with Danny and Michelle, so they'd all be going down in, as Keaton put it, dumb suits. Also, as he put it, it felt like Elvis walking into Caesars. This would worry many parents who were bringing their kids to see what they thought would be a fun, cool comic book movie. I'll get more into that in the afterword. Tim was able to deliver on his promise to make an even darker Batman film than the first one, and the results pretty much spoke for themselves. The results spoke for themselves. Batman Returns was a monster hit, grossing about roughly $162.8 million domestically at the box office. Yes, which is almost approaching the numbers of the first film. It was still a huge hit, but was critically panned by all accounts. This proved to be a viable commercial hit for Warner Brothers, but not the hit they were hoping for, as it failed to generate a lot of toy sales, which is what superhero films tend to do. Well, we'll touch base more on this with the afterward video, but for now, I'm going to leave it at this, saying, well, happy 30th anniversary to one of the greatest sequels I think I've ever seen in my lifetime. And also... I hope you enjoy the review that follows.